Good afternoon, good evening, maybe good morning for some of you. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step Zoom workshop. Please join me in prayer for an open mind. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and you for an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. This call is being recorded. We've taken a deep look at our brokenness. It's the word I use currently in the set aside prayer. Of course, we started this work originally, maybe not this workshop, but this work of recovery when we addressed our addiction. And that's clearly was the reason that Alcoholics Anonymous was created, that Bill Wilson wrote the big book and attempted to institutionalize his experience, really challenging his original experience with the six steps, wanting it to be even more effective. So he created the 12 steps because he refined the process based on his knowledge and experience when he was four years sober. The big book was published in April of 1939. And in that text, he refers to a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. We encountered that for the very first time, that metaphor. In step two, when he says the step two is the cornerstone that is placed on the foundation of a spiritual arch through which we walk to freedom. It's a wonderful image. We are creating a spiritual arch through which we walk to freedom, freedom from our addiction. That's the first promise. But very regularly throughout the text, he tells us it's not the real problem. And we had hopefully the understanding and the experience of looking at unmanageability as the real problem, the spiritual malady. And that's the reason I use brokenness, not addiction. Our will is deficient in that it will always choose me. And because of the experience of powerlessness, and let's get really clear about that because we get so used to the term powerlessness, it means very little to us. But in your journey, if you took this journey as the assignments described it, you have a deep appreciation of the words used in the big book about addiction, allergy, craving on the one hand, obsession, delusion on the other hand, and certainly see powerlessness, no choice, no power of choice. When I start, I cannot stop. When I stop, I cannot stay stopped. But I hope you were even more impressed with the knowledge and more connected to the experience of unmanageability. That's the best kept secret in the 12-step rooms. 
And when we talk about unmanageability as represented in the bedevilments and the underlying cause as selfishness and self-centeredness, which is the human condition, it's really new information to most people. And some of them have been around 10 and 20 and 30 years. So I'm saying Bill really emphasizes, he spends 35% approximately of his book time in the big book on the first step. That's the second most use of time allocation in the book from one from from the face page the title page to page 164 about 35% step 1 is the launching pad step 12 is the orbit it's really interesting he implies he doesn't call the first step the foundation but he implies it because he says in step two, <clears throat> we place the cornerstone of the spiritual structure on this spiritual structure. This willingness is the cornerstone. And in step three, you'll see that he says step three is the keystone. And he doesn't mention it again, this metaphor, until we get to page 75 and finish the fifth step. And he says, now we've walked through the spiritual arch to a new freedom. So apparently he assumes that step one is the foundation to that arch that we're laying the cornerstone in building the spiritual arch. And it's only in step 12. I'm not sure exactly where, I think it might be in a vision for you, where Bill says step 12 is the foundation stone the foundation stone, and we've come full cycle from step one, the foundation, to continuing to enlarge our spiritual life. We'll see that when we get to Bill's story next week on page 14, where he tells us what that means. We've looked at it when we looked at obsession and, and Jim's story, the fellow who put a little whiskey in his milk that obsession that we're powerless over. We have no choice when we begin, we have no choice when we stop. And we have no choice about managing our lives. Bill, uh, Bill says that Jim did not relapse because he thought a drink would be a good idea. He said, he relapsed because he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And now we know from our interpretation and Bill's own words that he doesn't mean prayer meditation. And he doesn't mean helping other people. He doesn't mean uh, going to meetings. He does mean helping other people. On page 35, I think, failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And on page 14, he says, we perfect and enlarge our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. The, the, the big book has such internal integrity. And it takes a while to become familiar with the phrases and the meanings and the instructions. But once we can apply all of these instructions to our lives, and then help other people with it, the book becomes more organic and more familiar to us so that we can connect the dots. In step two, at the beginning, I asked you a question that isn't in the big book. Once you've accepted or experienced and surrendered to your powerlessness, a complete defeat, I don't have the power of choice. For my addiction, I don't have the power of choice with regard to my managing my life and reality. Then we go in a search for power. On page 45, Bill said, and we looked at the two questions. 
where and how are we going to find that power? But I asked you to look at two questions even before that. What do you believe and how do you behave? Which hopefully you had a new experience with that confrontation. Belief is pretty easy, behavior is pretty hard. And I found a total mismatch between my belief and my behavior at 10 years of sobriety. That did not prevent me in the two prior journeys through the steps from having a spiritual awakening. My knowledge, understanding, and belief in God is not necessary for me to have a spiritual awakening was my conclusion. Please hear that. It, it gives us great hope. We don't have to know. We don't have to understand. We don't have to believe. We don't have to do anything perfectly and fully. We need to be willing. And that's what he says on page 47. Do you believe? Or if you don't, are you willing to believe? He's talking to a group of agnostic and atheist when he's writing this chapter. That may not be you. And then again, it might be you at that point. But then on page 53, and this is where we looked at the real, what I consider to be bullseye fulcrum of step two. On page 53, God is or God isn't, what is your choice? Oh my, we've just spent weeks, maybe months actually on step one where we realized and experienced that we don't have sufficient power for choice. And now in step two, Bill is asking us to make a choice. No, no, it's that clear. Page 53, God is or God isn't. What is your choice? And I suggested that that was an act of faith a decision, and that your acceptance of it is an act of your mind saying, I agree, I'm going to accept it. And that's belief. And then you translate it into your feet. You act as if it's true, even if you don't know it, and even if you don't believe it, and even if you don't have any emotion about it. But you act as if, and that's trust. Faith is the decision. Belief is the acceptance by your mind, and trust is the implementation in your behavior, in your feet. And I understood finally and very clearly what faith meant. Very empty, very thin, very dark in some, in some instances. And yet I hold that decision. Did you make the decision or didn't you? Then act as if you did. It's become a mantra that's guided me through any weak spots or dark spots. And the interesting thing is when you act differently, you begin to think differently and you begin to feel differently over time. Not the next day, not the next week, not the next month, but eventually. And then <clears throat> Bill navigates through emotions on page 54. He shows us how he really respects emotions. They're critical for our human survival emotions. They're a translation of our instincts. We'll see that in spades deeply in step four, our instincts are fight, flight, and freeze, survival instincts at the biological level, at the chemical level, at the emotional level, at the limbic system, that second brain, they get translated into resentment and fear and dishonesty. Resentment, anger, that fight instinct, fear, that anxiety to run for safety, for, for, for survival. 
and freeze being the final basic biological instinct that we translate emotionally into hiding camouflage or dishonesty. And we look at all of that when we get to the fourth step. So emotions are really critical for survival. And Bill says this, he talks about poetry here. Have we not variously worshiped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves? Mental goosh flesh. Talks about love here. Did not these feelings have to do with pure reason? No, not at all. But they are the tissue out of which our lives were constructed. Listen to his respect for emotions, especially for us as addicts. The tissue out of which our lives are constructed. These feelings determine the course of our existence. They brought us to addiction. And fortunately, we suffered sufficiently. They brought us to recovery. We get tired of suffering. Now on page 55, Bill tells us that answer to the two questions on page 45. Where and how are we going to find that power? Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. Page 55 in the middle of the book, in the middle of the page. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. Oh, that's the answer to how. How do we do this? Finding power, search. Every one of us could tell anybody that we talk to, we're seekers. We've been seekers prior to coming into a program. Most of us have sought something through church or therapy or self-help. We're seekers in an un unusual energy about that. Carl Jung says alcoholics are uniquely spiritual. They're seeking the spirit, but they mistranslate it into spirits and they create their problem. And he has a phrase at the end of that letter to Bill Wilson in Latin, spiritus contra spiritum. The spirit with a capital S is the antidote to spirits. A great play on words and it's a mystical insight actually. It's the insight that Bill had in his mountaintop experience. Our relationship with power is the antidote to the power of alcohol in his case. We had to search fearlessly. God is as much a fact as we are. We found the great reality, another wonderful metaphor, capital G, capital R, deep down within us. Oh, look at that. He's just answered the question, where? Not in church, not in the sky, not in dogma, not in theology, not in a person. Deep down within each one of us is this life force. And he says, and he pounds it home here, in the last analysis, it is only there that God can be found. And I'm reminded of Appendix 2 that we looked at at the beginning of our workshop. The crossover phrase on page 567, 568. Unsuspected inner resource. And it gives it new meaning. Unsuspected. I didn't, with all my knowledge and all my teachers and all my effort, I never really understood or looked for. God or the spirit deep inside myself. Unsuspected, inner, deep down in me, resource. A power that is in me, that is not me, that is available to me. Oh, that's the syllogism there. That's the logic of this. You may or may not agree with my interpretation, but this is my interpretation. 
This is such an important thought that Bill says it twice. Now, he never does that. In fact, he has an operating principle in his literary style to not put the same words in the similar, in the, in, in conti contiguous sentences. He says that on, on a tape I heard one time when they was asked about the difference between step six and seven character defects and shortcomings. And Bill just laughed. He says, I was taught in my English lessons that we don't use the same word in consecutive sentences. They're the same. Well, here he is completely going against that operating principle. Not only is he using same words in, contigu in con continuous sentences, he's giving us a full paragraph that's completely redundant to the prior paragraph. We can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice. Oh, so he's really embracing the set aside attitude. We need to have our prejudice, our prior information, our prior experience, our prior locked down position. We, we need to release it and have it change. Enables you to think honestly. Oh, there. In addition to searching diligently, we need to think honestly. That's how. Encourages you to search diligently. That's how. So now he has search fearlessly, search diligently, and think honestly. Again, within yourself. He doesn't leave it alone. He wants to bring it home to us. Then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. Look at that, capital B, capital H. It was meditation on that phrase that brought me to phrase it. The journey is the destination. The journey is the destination because there's no place to go. One of the mystics said, there is no place that there is not God. Confirming and reinforcing what Bill had as a mystical insight on page 53. God is or God isn't. God is everything or there is no God, he said, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. What is your choice? If there is a God, whatever that word is, as a symbol represents as a reality. The word is not the reality. It's the awkward attempt on a human being, a finite human being, to put into words an infinite reality. Of course, we'll fail every time, but it's the best we can do. With this attitude, you cannot fail. Well, I'm a big book literalist and fundamentalist. What does that mean? What attitude? I look it up and it says a stance, a perspective. You've heard it put in slang probably in conversation. He has attitude. It's not a compliment. But it's a way of looking at reality or themselves or other people. With this attitude, you cannot feel, oh, add, oh, think honestly, search diligently, search fearlessly. These are the attitudes. Thinking with my mind and searching with my will. I don't think it's an accident that he says thinking once and searching twice. Because, in fact, he's reinforcing what we already looked at, and that is that faith, faith is a decision. And that's what Bill asks us to do, is make that decision on page 53. God is or God isn't. Your choice. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. And we're reminded of the step itself. Came to believe. Came to believe. A process, not an event. I was 10 years sober. Not that I didn't believe intellectually or even emotionally. I did. 
but I didn't believe practically. God was irrelevant in my life, and I could look at that and see that in my own behavior. I didn't meditate every day. I was self-reliant. I didn't rely on a power other than myself on a regular conscious basis. But at that moment, doing this work this way, I realized that it was my choice, an act of faith. It was my choice, an act of belief. And it was my choice to translate that into behavior. Now we're going to look at the uh, rest of this chapter next week and bring it home in the conclusion. I've asked you to write out <clears throat> what you need and want as attributes and qualities of this reality that we name. I also want you to read the final half of Bill's story pages 9 through 16, in the 12 and 12. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. In the big book, 9 through 16. We looked at the first half of Bill's story when we looked at step one, because that's his first encounter with alcohol and his disintegration over time, bottoming out on page eight. Then he's in the hospital. Ebby comes to visit him, page four. Page 13, he works the steps with him on his second day of hospitalization. And page 14, Bill has his mountaintop experience. We'll explore all of that next week, taking a, a look at Bill's story, the highlights of it. And then uh, for the following uh, week after that, we'll take a look at a step three for the first time. I am not giving that assignment nine at this point, but if in fact you're so inclined, you can move forward. Read the 12 and 12, step two in the 12 and 12. I'd like to bring step two to conclusion next week. And that conclusion is that you actually make a decision about your concept. That's all. But that's what step two is, your decision about your concept. Not your sponsor's concept, not the big book's concept, not your religious tradition's concept. I mean, it's fine if that's what you want to incorporate. Of course, we have no rules. But be honest with yourself. Get really clear with yourself. And if you don't know, make a placeholder. I like the word mystery or it with a capital I. I did have a reaction. You used the word self-reliant and I found that I like that word and I hadn't, I've been trying to describe what my behavior is in relationship to what I, I believe my higher power to be. And um, right. uh, I'm writing, I slip into self-will, I try to control and manipulate, blah, blah, blah. I mean, self-reliant kind of like sums it all up. Mm -hmm. um, I have these moments when I decide that I'm the one that really um, <laughs> can make, you know, better decisions and things. Um, you know, but what I think is, is, and I keep coming back to this all the time, is what is different than before, the, probably the biggest difference from before is before being before um, uh, abstinence and sobriety is um, that I feel that I'm more sensitive to his nudges. I feel that I'm more, I have that pause. Um, I have those moments when something happens and I, and I go, I, I have this thought and I know that it's, it's God given these thoughts and that, you know, it just, happens quicker. Um, okay. But what was your um, experience with asking yourself the question about what you believe and how do you behave? Um, my what do I believe was quite lengthy. Um, yeah, mine and, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, go it, ahead. My, my belief is that it's a, it's a bunch of stuff, but then, you know, it comes to conclusion where it's my will or his will, if that's really what I believe. If I really believe he's in control of everything and that he makes all the decisions, um, you know, or that he makes the, let's, let's, that's let's, he makes all the decisions. No, 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 no. You're in the ring with me. I'm not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> Number one, do you really believe God's in control? Yes. So you don't believe you have free will. 
No, I mean, oh. I, do believe, I do believe I have free will, but my free will, it happens, but I still believe that he is manipulating and watching my walls and watching. But you don't have head. free will. What? So you don't have free will. I do. God's manipulating you. No, he's not manipulating me. He's watching. You said that. He's watching. He's repeating your words. So I have free will to do what I decide to do, but I believe that he protects. Maybe that's a better word. He protects and will, you know, he, I keep coming back to manipulate, like situations maybe, like, right. like, like right. the, the, right. the boundaries, you know. No, no, you this, so is, this is what you believe. This is what you believe. That's okay. Right. But, and, but you also <laughs> pretty generously use the word he. Why do you do that? Um, because I, years ago, visualized my higher power as a he. Okay. All right. And, and it's, that's pretty consistent with the writings that we see in all spiritual literature. Right. And so I don't have any problem with that. Your, and and, and um, what I do, though, is I challenge, especially women, to challenge themselves in terms of their consciousness. All right. And, and I don't have an opinion on it. I just want to make sure that you're conscious of the use and you clearly are. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so when you asked yourself the question about behavior, what was your experience there in contrast to what you believe? Well, that's the thing. It's like, I, I, I know that I, I know that there's a decision, like when I go to make a decision and it can be as trivial as wasting time or using it productively or, you know, bigger decisions. I, I know what his will is, but sometimes I make the decision to not do that. Does that okay. make sense? Well, yeah, absolutely. And how do you know what God's will is? Um, generally, sometimes it's just what the next right step is. Yeah, you know? that's right, actually. Yeah. Common sense. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's and that's where it comes down to that self will that you talked about, that self reliance. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. But I like that I can identify it faster now and I can. Um, you know, make it better or whatever you want to say. And after you do the fourth through seven, you'll even identify it more quickly mm -hmm. and make mistakes less frequently and correct it more quickly and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, for me, coming to believe, it, it, I had a very set idea of what God was when I first came in because of my upbringing, but I didn't think that God really wanted anything to do with me. Like I wasn't special enough or good enough. Yeah. Um, but um, I've been I've been clean in NA 30 years and um, yeah. I'm really grateful that my concept of God has changed. Um, one of the things that's happened to me um, since I've been clean um i've been writing in a journal where i only write good things in that journal and um and that's to kind of remind me when i'm in a terrible way of some sort about all these wonderful experiences i've had that's cool. even before i got clean yeah um i was supposed to die at 18 months and i did not obviously i'm here <laughs> um but uh, my concept of God currently is, I wrote this down, um, that God allows me to experience life, period. Um, See, and, and, and so that's the acceptance of reality that I'm really talking about there. Protects us from nothing, but supports us in everything. Allows me to experience life is a great way to phrase that. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, to learn, to enjoy, to feel pain, um, mm -hmm. to help others. And then I wrote as in a little column, like, to stretch and grow or wilt and shrink. You know, he's, he's allowing me to experience it whatever way I want to. And I do find that my reliance on God <laughs> makes things a lot easier, even when it's some really crappy stuff coming down the pike, right. you know? And um, so I feel like my, my faith in my higher power 
is my buffer from life's trials and tribulations. I, I call it my shock absorbers. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, my faith and belief are the shock absorbers that allow me to navigate the speed bumps. Okay, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah, well, it's in the same, you know, metaphor that you're using. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, so so I'm really glad that I've, I've written in that one journal. Yeah. Um, because it really brings things uh, into perspective for me. Yeah. Um, too many really awesome coincidences for it to all just be me. Yeah. You know, there's something out there. I choose to call it God. And, um, you know, and like I said, um, my belief, I, I've always had this thought that I'm always going to be okay. Not that I'm going to be great and wonderful and awesome and woo, the world's being handed to me, but I'm going to be okay. So even if like I got COVID and died, you know, my thought is, is that I've done so many really cool things with my life. Yeah. I've been able to help a lot of people in recovery. I've been able to, I get an idea and I follow through on it and I reap wonderful benefits. So the fact that, um, you know, if I got COVID and died, I'd be cool. You know, I mean, as long as I didn't give it to a bunch of people, you know, wear my mask, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of like what my perspective on on God and life is at but this the, moment. Your, your perspective has been developed because you looked at through your journaling the positive stuff. Correct. Yeah, that bad uh, things happen to good people. I mean, life just happens and shit stuff can suck. You know, <laughs> that's right. yeah. There's there's a lot of evil people out there wanting to just mess people up. You know, but um, but but that, that stuff. But that's just reality. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Everybody's given free will, not just the good people. You know. Exactly. And and so yeah. So that that that's what what um. Uh, the, yeah, I'm really glad that I've I've stuck around in recovery, heard so many things from people, done searches on the internet, you know, just, just really trying to take in what other people have said and um, right, not, just, seeker, not just blind. But you're a seeker that's evaluating, but focused on the positive. And there was a movement change in psychology in the 1990s up to that point, they focused on abnormal behavior, mental illness. And this psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania said, well, what if we focused on normal psychology and mental wellness? What would that look like? Because for the last hundred years, we haven't made much of a contribution to society. And he created positive psychology. And out of that has come this evidence that when we focus on positive things, they grow and they change our attitude. That's why that gratitude list recommendation is so powerful. Oh, yeah. Make a list of what you're grateful for. One, 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 one thing added every day and never repeat it so that you have to become quite creative as you reach out into your last, you know, 24 hours as to what you're grateful for. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, I had torn my ACL and this doctor, she blew off my surgery twice. Yeah. I was really spitting bullets, okay? You know, first time, oh, she's getting married. I'm thinking, who doesn't know they're getting married? You know, and then she got pneumonia and I'm like, I hope she got pneumonia on her honeymoon. I was so pissed off. I'm right, walking around on crutches. But what happened was, Two times that I went into the uh, facility to be seen, I saw a dude with no legs. Mm -hmm. And I went, yeah. hey, I got a pretty good shot of walking on both my legs yeah. in whatever time it takes. But I just like went, oh my God. And I felt like that was God giving me that hit of gratitude. Yeah, I don't like what's going on. I'm, I'm having to take a bus because I can't drive, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, but trying to focus on the positive really helps. Yeah. 
Well, and if, uh, if anybody out there is interested in a little bit more on that, uh, Victor Frankl is a Viennese psychiatrist that wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. I may have mentioned it before, but he's in a, Auschwitz in a concentration camp in 1945. And when he got out, he wrote a book on survival. And he said the only thing that allowed him to survive was that he couldn't change. He knew he couldn't change the guards or the weather or the circumstances. The one thing he could influence was his attitude about it all. And that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Having an attitude of acceptance and going right back to what I do believe Dr. Paul was talking about in that story in the back of the big book is acceptance of reality as it is. That's not to say that we just accept poor behavior in our midst. No, no. But we accept reality as it is. And that if you have any problem with that kind of acceptance, Al-Anon has made a science out of determining what is uh, within our sphere of influence and what isn't in our sphere of influence. What's our business and what isn't our business. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks okay. very much. Step two is hard. I haven't yet done assignment eight where I talk about what I need and want my higher power to be because when I did assignment seven, I guess my belief in higher power is loose and then how I behave regarding my higher power is even looser. So it's a very, um, you know, my feet don't often walk in the light and love of some kind of power. I'm very willful, obstinate, stubborn, um, fearful, controlling, confused. Um, Sounds like an addict to me. <laughs> I'm in the right place. You are absolutely in the right place. That's right. Yeah. You know, when people say, you know, I get on my knees and I pray, mm -hmm. I never get on my knees. Mm -hmm. Well, why would you even think that that might be a good idea? Why do you think other people do it? Well, when I look at them, they're abstinent. And I think maybe that's a linchpin for that. Well, um, and but, but why do you, why would you get on your knees? Um, to kind of put me in, like, why that particular act? I'm assuming is to put me in a power of kind of um, a position of like service or like being um, prayerful and and thoughtful, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a it's a ritual uh, to reflect the intention of prayer in the presence of awesome power. The man who took me through the steps helped me answer that question because I'd done it routinely because it's part of my religious tradition and I mm. did it without it much thought at all. And he said he got on his knees not to get God's attention but to get his own attention. He got on the knees as an act of humility and subordination in terms of the relationship with this higher power. I thought it was a great, a great um, explanation. For a, a long time, I did pray the third step and the seventh step on my knees on a daily basis. I haven't probably done that in 20 years. Um, it just isn't necessary for me. Mm. I can sit quietly and humbly and sit in the presence of power. Now, I don't need to express it in physical ritual. So that, that's really, am I, so I, I'm, I'm trying to give a balance to it. It's not, well, we need to challenge everything that we think and do in order to really understand why we're doing it. Mm. I don't, um, I don't feel like I need to get on my knees mm -hmm. necessarily, but Apparently, I remember you not doing it. No. Yeah. Right. But, so yeah. that 
that that that was a, just a sort of a sidetrack. It's absolutely not essential at all. So it's mm. probably better that we don't even have to discuss it. But tell me a little bit more about your experience with step two. Well, here's the naughty student in me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm to t- and I'm sorry, I feel cheeky, but I'm going to say it because this is the kind of crowbar that I need, right? right. If I act as, as if God is true, so I've got two choices. I turn towards power or I'm in the disease. And I'm a lot of the time I'm over here. So if I act as there's a God or a power greater than myself, how exactly is that going to help me? Mm-hmm. Like, as in, it doesn't, you know, God's not a magical wizard that, like, makes pain go away and um, fixes issues and yep. whatever. How how does it help me? Good. Yep. I don't know. Right. And That's true. And those are great questions. Mm. Yeah. But let me ask you, uh, are you in a 12-step program? Yes. And what does it suggest in step two? Um, come to believe. So, so I don't necessarily so have to you, do it. So, so are you, do you need power? Yes. I didn't say, do you need God? I didn't say that. I said, do you need power? I do. Yeah, yeah I do. All right. And so the suggestion is in step two, that if you need power, that you find and embrace power based on your perception. So tell me why you're resisting this. Probably because I'm scared of, um, you know, you said earlier. Not at step three. No, but you know how you said we've got that really tight grip? Yes. I'm scared of even releasing it a little bit because okay. well, I'm is very it, scared. Is, is, is your tight grip working for you? No. Well, you're welcome to keep it. Mm. But if you want what we have, which is freedom from the tight grip, You'll take the directions that we give you, even though you don't believe in them. And if I'm still resistant to that? You take the actions anyway. Mm. I mean, first of all, you can resist all you want. Have a great suffering life. I already do suffer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So you're you're welcome to be the four-year-old that digs her heels into the ground and said, no, and stomps the feet and goes, I'm going to do it my way. Have a wonderful life. Mm. Nobody cares. (laughs) Hmm. You'll I'm only suffer, laughing because you'll, sounds... suffer, you'll suffer and die and nobody will come to your funeral. Mm. But they'll, they'll go on living their lives. So, I mean, you can have a tantrum, right? Mm. Yep. I'm not attached to your happiness. Yeah. I'm, I'm passionate about you seeing the truth of the lie that you've been living. Yeah, and I guess at a bare minimum, I'm enjoying that you're calling me on my bullshit. And that's how you started. You, you invited this dialogue. You, yeah, opened, you opened the door. It was very clear. You said, I'm going to be cheeky. Okay, well, I'm going to be cheeky back. <laughs> Good. <laughs> But that's kind of what I need, you know. Otherwise, it's all just poppycock. You know, exactly. it's just bullshit. I am, I'm 100% there. Yep. Mm. yep. And that's why I say, if you don't have what you want and you see what you want in what we got and we suggest that what we got is what we 
is a result of what we did, then you might want to experiment with doing what we did. Mm -hmm. You know, when, yeah, like I hear it, like I've been in program for a few years, um, consistently not abstinent, consistently loose, consistently, you know, one foot in, one foot out, and it's how I live my life. Consistently resisting, consistently maintaining Mm. the old attitude because nobody's going to tell you what to do. Yes. Right. And it, when that has a hold of you, when that has a hold of me so tight yeah. and I really do want something to crowbar me over the head, yep. like these conversations are the closest thing and, you know, conversations with my sponsor are the closest things. Is there anything else I can do to crack it more? Because it's really got a hold of me. It's really got a hold of me. Yeah, yeah. What I really want to say and will say to you is, no, there's nothing that you can do except Mm -hmm. implode in that defeat. Implode in the defeat that there's nothing that you can do. Now listen and pray and take direction and take action and see what happens knowing that nothing's going to happen because you created it. Everything's going to happen because you're willing to be connected to the power that you don't even know exists. And that's what Bill said on page 47. Are you willing to accept that there might be a power other than yourself that is available to you? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, that's why you're here. That's why you're having the dialogue. No, 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 I get it. Yeah. And he says, as soon as you say that, that's the cornerstone. That's the door that opens just enough that the light comes through. So just be patient and and stay vulnerable and courageous in your direct conversations with your sponsor and with Mm -hmm. me and with your fellows. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no. Wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I don't know what I believe. Okay, that's fair enough. Keep it <laughs> open. No, no, keep it open. Uh, well, I I don't know what I believe because I just, I know that I believe that there is a higher power that in my life, in the world, I believe there is a spiritual presence. I know that this spiritual presence is in me and is in the world. I can sense this presence when I'm in my quiet times, in my meditations. You believe um, that there is some sort of life force there. And yes. you use the term presence. And I love that term because it's ambiguous enough that I'm not putting images on it. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. If I say he, I was raised in a very fundamentalist um background which is coming back into vogue i understand mm-hmm. um and uh i can't if i start calling god he even if using the word god sometimes it brings up images that i don't really want to associate with my higher power and it's very personal and now you're as clear about your history so that you know what to avoid because they're traps for you yes yeah So I know that what I really want to believe is that this higher power, like so many people in my fellowship will say, you know, you're, um, God's got a good, good plan for your life. You can, you know, trust, just stay abstinent and trust your higher power, you know, not my will, but God's will. And, um, I mean, I, I like that. It sounds so nice that I can just stop worrying and stop planning and just trust that, you know, this wonderful, benign, compassionate, higher power that they all seem to think exists um, is on your side, is on their side. But I try to figure out how the Christians in Syria and how the Christians in Sudan and how the Christians in Iran and Iraq feel 
you know, do they feel like their higher powers is wonderful, kind, benign, compassionate, just? Or even more relevantly, the Christians in 1940 in Germany were praying to be yes. Christians in America. <laughs> and yes. In... <laughs> yes. So, and so, uh, so, no, it's a very legitimate question. Um, and so I've challenged that question and I've reflected on it and I wrote out uh, some reflections on that for your consideration. So it'll be interesting, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, one of the stories in the big book, this current edition, is um, acceptance. A lot of people in my fellowship read the, quote, acceptance page right. every night. And the author of that story says that um, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah. Um, well, um, I agree with it in the sense of it, happens for a reason, meaning that it's evolution. I don't believe that it's a plan and all predetermined by God. And if you have free will, then it's not predetermined because you can go right or left and God doesn't get in the way of that. Otherwise, your will isn't free. From my standpoint, this is the way I think about things. But do you think God knows before we make our choices what we're going to do? Well, I'm confident that's true because God is and God is everything. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. That's the logic of that theology, if in fact you want to follow the logic of it. But you get to choose what you want to believe about all of that. I'm just not sure. Yeah, and yes. it's a wonderful place to be. Not sure is so you're open now to information and to discernment. It's great. Because I feel like I feel like God's capricious. God is arbitrary and capricious. Well, and you said you feel, all right? And, that's what I feel. And, and that is a feeling. It's not necessarily a thought, but you have to make a choice as to whether that's true or not. And that's a God that I would abandon. I would abandon that God and upgrade to a God that is not capricious and arbitrary. But then how do you explain everything that goes on in the world? Well, okay. I mean, uh, there's a book on that by a rabbi. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? All right. Now, I read the book. I don't think he answered the question personally. But Everybody puts that at the feet of free will. Well, but here's, here's my answer to the question. I think that that is, if we have free will and there is mental illness, that explains an awful lot of suffering in the world. Now, if you have a belief about God that if a true God was God, there would not be any suffering, then you're, in a, you're, you're going to have a difficult time with the word God and with the reality God. But if God is just, I mean, yes. I have, there's so many things that I feel like conflict with each other. Well, no, I, but you're using the term feel again, and I'm appealing to your thinking about this, not your feelings. Okay, my belief then. My thinking and my thoughts are that I just can't make sense of a God who claims to be just, but yeah, then allows yeah. so much suffering. Well, um, but you see, you're projecting your human nature onto God as if God is just a superhuman being. And I've used this image many times, maybe here, and maybe I've worn it out, but try this. So the deer drinks water at the lake, and it's really good for the deer. But the mountain lion eats the deer. It's really bad for the deer, but it's really good for the mountain lion. Now, earthquakes happen because of geology. Tectonic plates move. That's evolution. All right? The, the weak in the, in the herd of animals... Are, are picked off as prey. And that's evolution, the survival of the fittest. And people could say, oh, no, that's cruel. No, that's reality. What you're saying is reality shouldn't be this way if there's a God. Really? Think that one through. I try. Well, I know I get that. That's why we're having this conversation. It's a very relevant conversation. It's very beneficial to many people on the call because they're thinking similarly and they've not thought it through perhaps, or they have, and they've come to some conclusion. I can't think it through. It drives me crazy. I start uh, wanting to have this, oh, I just trust God. And I do, you know, in the mornings, in my quiet times, 
when I just put it all aside and I just every day for the past you mean two if weeks, the world didn't have people in it, you'd be just fine. Yeah, I've been so misanthropic <laughs> a few times by my husband. So anyone yeah, I, see, I, I think the story that uh, Dr. Paul wrote, uh, as you say, in the big book about acceptance, he's saying accepting reality. He's not saying accept genocide. All right, genocide is ugly, and it's criminal, and it's totally against human nature, but it is part of reality because of free will and mental illness. So if we go back to our example of the Christians who have been persecuted throughout time. Yes. How, how, you know, how can, how could someone in that situation say, I trust that God's going to take care of me? And then they get like... Because God's not going to take care of you. That's a, that's a fallacy. I heard it said wonderfully, and I've, I've said it here, I think, and it's a startling confrontation. I heard it from somebody. I don't know why they said it or where they got it from. But I took, it was so startling, I, I had to take it into meditation for a long time. And I, and I saw the truth of it, finally. God support God protects us from nothing and supports us in everything. Well, then what's this whole step three about made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, as I understand? Oh, wait, wait, over to the care of God supports us in everything. It's totally, totally complementary to that. But if you think that you're going to be protected from a hurricane because you pray, you're going to die in a hurricane. If you think that God's going to provide you a hot dog because you meditated really well all week long, (laughs) you're you're going to starve to death because we have free will and we make choices and we take actions and we, and we incur the consequences of those actions. If I rob banks, I can do that with my free will. And I'll, I might be rich for a little while, but eventually I'll be shot or go to. What does this whole support of my higher power look like? Well, that's a question for you to answer. That's right. Bill says, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. That's the answer to your question if you want to spend some time meditating on it. It's a tremendous mystical insight concerning that, life force. Is that in the big book? And it's on page 46, by the way. Thank you. Last week's meeting was just tremendous, and you kind of confused me when um, I was reading page 53 in your spiritual awakening about, you you know, your sponsor suggested that you ask yourself your question, the question about um, how do you behave, Um, because what you behave is what you believe, and then you said it may have been a delusion, and then I think, yes, last week you also said you were, then you were an agnostic. I was, yes. But Why were you confused about that? Because, because I think you were a believer. You had how no, wait, many? Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't matter what you think. I know. Okay. No, so I know. tell me. So tell me why you think that my use of the term confused you. Okay, because um, do you think everybody who doesn't follow God's will and obey Him and do His will is agnostic? Well, now, when you say obey him, what does that mean? Do his will. What what is God's will? To love him and to love others. Okay, so you're you're quoting from the Hebrew scripture and from the Christian scripture. All right, but really, what what does it mean for you? That's what it means for me. I understand. Give me some... Don't give me don't give me platitudes and philosophy. Okay. Give me behavior. What does it mean? How do you know what God's will is? I know what God's will is because I do believe in him and I feel bad when I know that I'm doing something that I feel is against his will. Like for instance ruining my body eating the wrong things, mm-hmm. making myself sick. Okay. Or so, so God, 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 doesn't, God doesn't have rules. God has given you free will 
I and believe it. There's and and your biology is your business. There will be consequences for your not taking care of that body. You will gain weight if you eat in an unhealthy way. That's not. I mean, and if you feel bad about it, that's your problem. Well, you're absolutely right. And yeah. that's where free will comes in. And that's that where- nothing to do with God. That's where bad things happen to people. We do it to ourselves. Natural that's exactly, law. No, that's exactly right. We each have exactly the life that we've created by our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions, and our reactions and our behavior. We get, the, the Buddhists call it karma, and it gets some kind of a mystical connotation, but it's not mystical at all. It's very, very logical and practical. Karma merely means that there is an accumulated impact of the consequences of the actions that we take on an accumulated basis. If I'm consistently robbing banks, I'm going to get to go to prison. If I'm consistently overeating, I'm going to be fat and I'm going to die of diabetes or heart attack. That's just what it is. It's not a judgment. It's just the reactions that- Reality. The say it again. Reality. It, that is, thank you. It's just reality. That's right. And that's what um, I personally interpret, quote, God's will loosely as reality as it's manifesting. If it's raining out, wear a raincoat or stay inside. But don't rail at the weather because it's raining out. It shouldn't have rained today. The weatherman said it wasn't going to rain. Yeah, okay, it's raining today. But that's I'd be going back to what I think it was Ruth Ann was saying or, or somebody about uh, acceptance. It's not about accepting cruel behavior or abuse, verbal, emotional, or physical. It's not about accepting that. No, not at all. It's about accepting reality. If I'm in an abusive relationship, it's not going to change unless that person changes. You get hit once, you're going to be hit again. It doesn't matter what you think or feel or want. And that's reality. And the whole point of this process is to wake us up and consciously deal with reality as it is to the best of our ability yeah okay. well you've you've oh, answered so, it going, so going back so going back i, I want to continue the conversation but I, I also want to address your original thought about being a gnostic i called myself an agnostic because i was a practical agnostic my belief was here and my behavior was here so clearly, I didn't believe sufficiently that I behaved accordingly. Therefore, I'm a fraud. I really didn't believe. Well, wait a minute. Isn't agnostic um, that a you doubter. believe in the existence? You, no, you, the existence no, that's an atheist. It's unknowable. It's unknowable. It, uh, an agnostic said it's unknowable, and I doubt whether it's actually real anyway yes go ahead okay if you believe in uh christian history yeah what did satan do did he believe was he an agnostic when he turned his back and said i will not well first of all you're speaking about stories now when you talk about satan so let's stay with the practical okay well, you have a belief and it's your belief all right but it's, yeah. it's, it's not everybody's belief, and it's not verifiable, and it's just a story about reality. I, I understand that. Yeah. Well, I thought, thinking of your story, I yeah. thought that I believed, and I do believe, in God. But when it came you pray to... pray every morning? Yes. Do you meditate I'll, every morning? Well, I do now. Well, there you go. And so you. you're acting as if you, yeah, so you're very mm, integrated in your belief. Yep. Yeah. And I pray during the day and I pray at night. Here's the problem. Yes. I feel like I believe in God in everything except for don't touch my food. I don't acknowledge him as okay. that part of my life. Okay. All right. All right. I, I understand want that. Go ahead. And I'm working on it. And, and what? And I intend to make that part of my life, listening to him about what I should do with my health. 
Yep. Yeah. And my food. Yeah. And 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 awakening is a progressive gift where the dimmer switch goes up a notch at a time and there's more light and, and I hear it. All right. You've made progressive changes that have given you the opportunity to make more progressive changes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm very Yeah. And and, and and then we need to be patient with it. And the whole point of my story, as I repeat it so many times for you, for everybody, is that it just takes time. It took me 12 years from my standpoint to have a full step one and to begin to have a step two experience. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. about progress, not perfection. And it's that dimmer switch. We lean into it with our shoulder. We lean into the dimmer switch, pushing it up a notch at a time. And, and there is more light. Yeah. First of all, 17 years sobriety, I just realized working with you how powerless, I mean, totally powerless. I thought I had a little power. So that's good. And then um, in my 13th year of sobriety, I, I searched for God and a relationship with God. So I believe, I accept, I trust. And by, with his grace, I act differently. I think differently. I feel differently. And, and it's only his grace because I know myself, my old self too well. Um, and I also was taken to a place of willingness, but I wanted to go because I was tired of suffering. I was tired of doing the same thing over and over again, getting the same results. Right. So I wanted to go wherever he took me. Um, and then, um, but I have a question for you. Oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is, so I'm very, I'm, I'm a ar very arrogant person when it comes to God. And I think people should have, have my God and my religion and the way I think. And I want you to know that you really helped me when you, um, suggested we look up the meanings of the different, um, words that they use, God, spirit, universe, guide, and, it all comes down to the same thing. It all comes back to God. And it's like, oh, now when people talk like this, you know, nature, you know, I never understood that in the rooms when they would talk like that. It's like, it's God, it's God. And now I understand it. Now it's like, it's okay. It's okay for people to call it whatever they want. And that, that you help me. You help me with my arrogance. And I appreciate that. Yeah. It's but I do. Well, yeah, there's nothing that will help arrogance more than information. <laughs> yeah, right. I love knowledge. Knowledge is power. Well, Absolutely. It, is actually, it is actually. Um, and, uh, you know, when sometimes when I talk, somebody will come up and say, wow, you sound like you're really a good Buddhist. And I go, yeah, no, not so much. Or they'll come up and say, wow, you sound like you're a really good Christian. I go, yeah, not so much. Or, wow, you really understand the religion of Judaism. I go, yeah, not so much. Uh, you know, and I do understand them all from a comparative religion standpoint, but the dynamic underneath the 12 steps has given me the experience that most of the religions are talking about. And yet they use it different culture uh, because of different cultures at different times, they use different words. Uh, my own spiritual director said, well, the spiritual path is the spiritual path. And so, I, I mean, that summarizes exactly what you were just saying. Oh, I, it's amazing. From the pulpit, I'll hear priests, and I'm like, that's the, 12, that's the steps. He's talking about the steps. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. I hear that a lot in um, different things I listen to. But I do have a question for you, and that is, I'm growing in a relationship with God. I'm not going to ever understand him. I'm not going to ever really, you know, and it's okay. I don't need to understand them. But I want to grow in this relationship with God. And while I'm growing, is that, then I'm going to get to know myself better? Interesting. I'm going to quote now because it's an interesting insight that I got when I finished step five. On page 75, there's a set of promises. It, oh, says, yeah. it says, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know God better. And for me, it's really interesting that I've just spent months literally doing a fourth step all about me and hours just doing a fifth step all about me. 
And at the end of the fifth step, Bill says, now you know God better. Even though I thought I knew me better, now I know God better. And I think the reverse is true. The more light I have because of my relationship with the light, the more I see myself in the light of that relationship. All right. So tell me what your um, your experience so, was. You know, I know the addict. I know the codependent person. But the real deep down person yep. that God made me to be, I'm just getting to know her. But then, then I can tell you in my year 13 is when I started to seek out a relationship with God. And so as, as I continue to grow with my relationship with God through prayer, meditation, service, will I get to know myself better? Well, if you, staying with a metaphor now, if you place more light in your life that will dispel the darkness. And if you place more light through your relationship with the light, capital L, that will allow you to see yourself more truly as you are rather than the facade that's been developed over time by your unhealthy coping strategies. So my answer is absolutely yes, because you're in pursuit of a relationship with the light and the light's going to shine on and in you so that you can actually see the truth about you rather than the darkness that is shading that truth from you now. I understand what you said. I understand. And, and I, do, I do believe it. It's happened a little bit. And, you know, with his grace, it happened, you know, but I don't, I'm still getting to know me. But anyway, that's that's why we're doing this for a year. <laughs> Well, the fourth step is going to bring such power of awareness. In the beginning, it will be embarrassing, but down the road, it will be freeing in terms of self-knowledge. But uh, Herb, I've done 10 four steps. Can you do it? Not, I mean, I guess I'm working on new stuff, though, all the time, right? Because I'm growing. Well, let me ask this question. Have you done the steps out of the big book? Oh, yes, absolutely. Have you done a resentment inventory, third and fourth column, so that you've under, you, you've discovered in the third column your beliefs and in the fourth column your motives? Um, my motives, yes, no, but I'm not I, sure. I just, I just want the answer to the question. Have you done a third and fourth column in the big book? And, and had the experience of seeing your beliefs in the third column and your motives in the fourth column. I don't know about my beliefs, but I've done a four step with the columns and I definitely, but, but I was probably in denial about the beliefs. Well, or maybe you didn't get the kind of instructions that I, I've been shown and therefore I will give you because my, my experience was that it was, again, it was progressive for me. The first time I went through the steps with a step mechanic, I had a big experience with the fourth column, but not with the third column. The second time I went through, I had a big experience with the third column. And each time I had a different experience with the fear inventory and with the sex and dishonesty inventory. So I think- I understand have, what you're saying, yeah. If you, if you have, if you continue with the energy that you have, and the set-aside attitude about your prior experiences, I do believe you will have a, a new experience with some aspect of the fourth step. I, I believe you. I believe it, too. Okay. I, I'm very amazed how you're doing handling this God thing. I'm very, very impressed. You're very gentle and kind to all of us, <laughs> no matter what we believe in. And uh, it's just beautiful to see that. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I try to be gentle and kind. At the same time, I try to be direct. And sometimes I, I don't navigate that as smoothly as I should. But uh, you guys are very forgiving. Well, you know how sensitive us alcoholics are. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. One, of, one of the uh, wisdom women in the program said, no, we're not sensitive. We're self-centered. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> working on 
trying to um, decide or to contemplate what my God is, what attributes. And um, I've had a hard time. The thing that I that I do understand is nature. And um, I don't think, I, I love the things that you've said and I can grasp them as far as um, reality. It, it's just like as I watch the leaves falling from the tree, it's just the seasons, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And um, accepting that. And I do. That's a I very love... that's a very good uh, connection to reality, by the way, and and it really emphasizes what I'm attempting to communicate in terms of reality. These are just seasons. Winter is not bad. It's just a season. Go ahead, right. thank you very much. I like it very much. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that wasn't. But what I got hung up on is my resistance. I had periods where I looked at some food or whatever, and I had the presence or God's grace that the, it came to me, why do you really want to do this and following it through? And, and I was able to stop and I was saying, boy, this really works when I stop and I think and I pause. And then a month later, I just don't pause, don't do anything. And it made me feel like, you know, I didn't get God at all. I didn't get that. You know, I did. I got it. I had it. And then it left. Well, at this point, you've had an experience of some success by your definition and all you need to do now is get back on the bicycle and begin pedaling again right right You're right yeah there's i mean so don't be hard on yourself and judge yourself negatively here just say wow i had all this time and i was doing these things um maybe you want to challenge yourself a little bit with regard to what you're doing in prayer meditation and you have a relationship with a sponsor i'm a hearing yes but i'm not in love with her <laughs> not well uh, yeah right. i mean so you, you there's some there's some misgiving about her capacity to help you is what you're right saying. yeah right so, so it's your life you know don't right. worry about her feelings worry about your life and, yeah. if she's, and if she's not fulfilling what you want or expect or need, then find somebody else. Move on. Right. My question is, and what you just asked me, my willfulness is getting in the way. Well, again, have, that, that's yeah. the nature. Yes. So how do you break down your willingness, your will, willfulness? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's the entire point of steps four through seven. Right. Entire point, steps four through seven, is to take a look at the results of willfulness, that self-centeredness we looked at in unmanageability, and see that underneath each aspect of it, we're powerless and yet fully responsible. And when we come to step six and seven, we see that we... We need to pray that seven-step prayer. Mm. I, it, was in, it was an experience that I had that I needed to be specific with that, but I also needed to have a relationship of accountability to a sponsor and step guide so that mm -hmm. I wasn't just relying on my evaluation. I was getting objective feedback. Yeah, yeah, and that's... I, those are two very important points for me. Yeah. Specific, 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 big specific, yeah. and accountability. That that to yeah. me that, that that's the formula that changed my life right there. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
So, thank you, her. Thank you very much. Good dialogue. And um... I did do the exercise and wrote down what I wanted in my high power. And I, I reflected on the fact that I'd had quite a few spirit, really powerful spiritual experiences. And my high power always seemed to be this very nurturing, nearly like a much larger person than I that would pick me up and put, put me on their knee and look after me. So a little child's high power. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had some really powerful days where I've had like a, a, a wry, um, happy, high power laughing with me at me during the day. And it's been really special. And I, and I, when you talk to the other person about wanting to cling on to that, I wanted to cling on to it and it's disappeared. And then I've got that other part of me that is that um, bristle, you know, the words really jumped out of me with the big book at people who took, go, God, 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 just drives me nuts. And I go then into the defiant, what am I at a, you know, am, am I at a sort of um, a Christian picnic or something? You know, I mean, I, I have all the, you know, out comes all these views of missionaries and how, what the dreadful role of religion in the world and blah, blah. But in my quieter times, if I'm honest with myself, I don't set the intention every day. I, 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 I can't get on my knees. I've got rotten knees. So, I, I, but I lean over the bed, you know. And but I don't do it every day. If I'm honest with myself, when you say you don't do it every day, what is it? What is it? Pray, pray every. You know. Oh, you I don't. don't. I see. And why is that? Um, I'm not sure. I, cool. I, no, no, no. You are sure. Um, Think about it. I suppose it's the word prayer and the image of going on your knees. No, don't. See? Let's assume that you don't have to go on your knees. In fact, I haven't been on my knees in 20 years. So, when, and, I have, when, and I have a daily practice. So, so tell me about why you don't pray every day. Ah, well, I don't pray mechanically like that. I do, but I do when I, I do attempt to have a conversation with um, my higher power and, and call it higher power, it seems to work for me. Um, so I'm sort of a person who vacillates between the bristling and the going through a kind of mechanical motion of um, being in touch with my high power. I had a, a major crisis about a week ago. It was just a, a dreadful family situation that occurred. And I noticed I didn't go to my high power. I just, I did not go to my high power at all. And that shook me, you know. I knew I needed to slow down and think and just lean into the situation. But the other part of me just totally took over. And, and I guess I'm wanting a higher power that will, or that I develop the habit of, or that the, there is a higher power that when I'm going through a situation like that does take over for me, that it's an automatic thing rather than I go into major crisis. Um, so that's, you know, so my higher power will so when you were asked yourself those two questions about belief and behave, what was your experience with that? I, I think, well, that's it, the dissonance. There, there it is. I go into a crisis and I'm not behaving as if. You know, so it's holding me a lot of the time, but not all the time. It's not holding me with a the, with the big event, you know. To me, that's major dissonance. That's my unmanageability. Right. right. Yeah. So I don't know what steps to take. Well, or you see, but you're asking questions and you're being conscious of what your patterns are, what your thoughts are. And that's really the benefit of step two and these exercises. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong timetable. There's just your process and and your awarenesses and experiences. Just respect that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.
I am four and a half years abstinent. I've been in the program for a bit over five years. And so I'm a newcomer. <laughs> but I certainly think I've got it down. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I, I really relate to to what you're saying there and it, because I, I feel very comfortable in my concept of my higher power at the moment and I just see it kind of it's evolving with the with the process that you're you're leading us through and I really look I really view my higher power as love and I, I feel like it's so incredibly practical because if I want to bring love into my life I soften my heart I appreciate, I look out and I appreciate, I'm grateful. I try to be kind and compassionate. And in any difficult situation or any not difficult situation or just any situation, pouring some love in is a wonderful tool for absolutely transforming what's what's happening. So I, I certainly... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting a lot out of having that concept of having love as my, as my higher power. And I really see that I see my higher power as, as being very active from that point of view. I read your articles and, um, you know, you talk about love a lot in the articles. And yes, love is everywhere. And um, yeah, and, and on, the, on the topic of God's will, is there such a thing? I, I got, I'm not sure if I interpreted your article correctly, but I felt like you felt like, like, no, God didn't have a will. But I kind of feel like, well, if I, I kind of feel that God does have a will because God's will is love. And love can decide. Love can take action. It can influence. It can heal. Um, so, yeah. I uh, and, and the beauty of this is, I don't have to believe what you believe. You don't have right. to believe what I believe. Right. No, no. And These articles are meant to stimulate your thinking. That's correct. Yes. And and it certainly it, it certainly um, did do that. Um, but I, I, I also know that, um, well, I'm conscious that I think I know what my higher power is I'm, and I'm very comfortable with it. And I don't want that belief to kind of get in the way or, or to make me complacent and get in the way of, of helping me to really transform and really realize and really know. But yeah. Um, well, and, and, and you have a wonderful approach to it. I'm totally confirming and endorsing all of your reflections and even your questions and challenges. Um, the one thing that I'm hearing uh, from you, that central word of love is perhaps the word that you need to spend or have already spent a lot of time in. What does it mean? Mm. Well, I have spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I feel like, I mean, I've got a list of what is love. Mm. So for me, it's union, respect, Mm. Mm. appreciation gratitude kindness empathy compassion forgiveness mm. acceptance mm. defenselessness the last one? defenselessness oh defenselessness yes yes interesting defenselessness is love mm-hmm. surrender courtesy helping yeah. others yeah and service these are yeah. all that that's the manifestations and some of the characteristics of it yes yeah, in, in, in search, and I probably mentioned this before, but in this context, it's worth repeating. And that is, I looked up the word altruism. Yes. Al- altruism, in my de- dictionary, said doing something for somebody else mm. with no possible benefit for me. Mm. For me, that comes as close to unconditional love as I've been able to identify a definition or a good clear definition of what does unconditional mean, unconditional love. Doing something for the benefit of somebody else with no possible benefit for me. Mm. Yeah. Which is amazing to think- what you're saying, pardon me. Yes, yes. Well, it's amazing to think that you could do something for someone else without getting some benefit because the very, the very, because that is love and the very act of doing that 
I'm receiving when I'm giving love. I'm receive. That's how I receive love. Is, yeah. Yeah. Is by giving love. Yeah, but it's a byproduct, not not the original primary intention. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the last time we spoke, Herb. And you have to remember, I feel sorry for you because you've got to think, we're all saying this, the last conversation I had with you, and you have to remember, well, I'll explain. I don't I'll have tell to you. remember, I just have to just... respond to what you're saying now. That's the magic yeah, part. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I spoke about my family of origin who taught me that I am 100% responsible for what happens in my life. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you said to me, that they are right about that. You agreed with that. Mm -hmm. When I came into the program, I got a lot of relief because I stopped manipulating, strategizing, controlling, calculating, planning, negotiating, arranging, and organizing. I, I, I stopped doing all that. Wow. On, <laughs> That's a well, spiritual experience. <laughs> well, well it, it, it absolutely was. Yeah. Because I, I just trusted instead because really that was hell for me. Yes, of course. Living in that, in that environment where I was, you know, doing all of that. So I just trusted and I turned my life over to the care of God. And so now I am no longer responsible for my life. That's how I see it. I'm not responsible. That doesn't mean that I don't listen to guidance or call on God or do my very best every day. I just leave the outcomes to God. Because See, that's the, that's the distinction right there, and you've got it already, but the spirit, my spiritual director in 1989, when I was talking to him about my meditation practice, he said, you're responsible for the effort, not the results. Okay. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I'm not responsible for my life in the sense of really how it turns out. I'm responsible for showing up and taking the next indicated action. If I'm not getting the results that I want, then I need to change my actions. That's my responsibility. And, and that gives me 100% responsibility for my actions and my consciousness of evaluating the outcome of my actions. Because in fact, I have a mind that thinks and a will that makes decisions but there's a whole bunch of uh, the outcome that I'm not responsible for. Um, is if I'm not getting the outcomes that I want to change my actions. That's it. Like that is, that is quite. Yeah. That's, quite that's, the, that's emotional sobriety. Spiritual mm. sobriety is taking responsible taking responsibility for my actions and their consequences. Mm. So I need to pay attention to the consequences because no matter what my actions are, there will be outcomes. Are they yes. the outcomes I want? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I mean, a lot of the time they're not. When I look back at my life, you know, like it, it, it hasn't turned out, it's, it hasn't been a fairy tale. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Well, but if you were expecting a fairy tale, then you're in fantasy. Yeah. See, now Disney has spoiled us all. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no fairy godmother or prince or fairy dust. There's just mm. raw reality. Mm. Mm. And reality is non-negotiable and immutable. Reality mm. doesn't change. Mm. I need to change to live in reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and after our conversation and, and read, sorry, after the, the reading, when I read, after reading your articles, I really felt like reality is love, the real reality, like See? the real space that I, sh I want to be in. That's is love. From, from my standpoint, continuing on this conversation, that's the originating source force mm. unconditional love mm. in a book called tattoos on the heart have i mentioned that before uh no i don't think so um a, a, a jesuit priest who started homeboy industries here in los angeles as a workplace for young men and women to come out of the gangs and get back into society with skills and experience um 
in the book, which is a story of his journey, he has a phrase which is just wonderful. Perhaps God created humans because God thought they would enjoy it. Yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. See? There. That's the unconditional yes. love. God, if God is, doesn't need anything because mm. it is everything. Mm. Why on earth would God create humans? Mm. Because God thought they would enjoy it. Yeah. And I can enjoy it if I decide to. There. I, I mean, that, to that's decide. at the heart of it. That's really at the heart of happiness right there. Mm. Yeah. Um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, a, a Viennese uh, psychiatrist, wrote uh, after he got out of Auschwitz in the early 50s, probably wrote the book. It's a classic. Man's Search for Meaning. And he said, the only thing that we have any influence over is our attitude about the reality mm -hmm. around us. It's right at, the, it right at the heart of the serenity prayer. Mm. The only thing I can influence is my attitude about it. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Lord. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everybody.